Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Walking This Way's Impact Wars Podcast. I am Furman Jackson G. I'm the CEO and founder of Walking This Way's um, Impact Wars Podcast. We are, par- we are broadcasting from the DFW. That is for for I always wants to know. We're very excited to be back with y'all once again on this great Tuesday. We know that we are in the middle of July, but we're going to head into August. We know that this year is flying by. So I hope everybody getting their, getting everything done, getting everything accomplished, getting the thing they have set their mind to, to make a life for themselves, to better spread the good news, and most importantly, just really just making an all around impact. And I want to give a big shout out to those who listen to us on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and all social media platforms. If you're watching us on YouTube, go ahead and hit that like, subscribe. Um, but to try the YouTube channel. I also give a big shout out to those who watch us on Twitter. So I'm very excited once again to be here with you with my guest this, this evening. He's a community activist. He's a leader. He's an artist. Um, he's all about making impact. He's all about bring, being bringing righteousness for the people to the people. And I'm very excited to have Mr. Tim Hollis. Tim, thank you, my brother. Take time out your productive sketch to hang out with me. Talk about your career. Talk about the movement that you're doing back home in our hometown of Mobile, Alabama. Just making an all-around impact. We know faith without works is dead. You are an example of just not talking it, but being about it. You're all about getting out there, um, views, getting the stuff done that needs to be done. So go ahead, my brother. Go ahead and introduce yourself. I did I did, did the top service of it, but just go ahead and do yourself to the audience here on Walking This Way, Impact Boys Podcast. Yeah, man. Well, first, I got to say shouts out to you yourself first, uh, Furman. You know, thank you for bringing me on to the show. Um, glad to be back on Walking His Ways, uh, my second trip here. So I'm, I'm really excited. And like you say, faith without works is dead. And just to see where we both have grown to over that course of time it's truly amazing and it's only a, a journey that god can ordain and so right. with that being said um i'm tim hollis community activist community organizer uh political candidate um have not yet crowned a seat but truly and truly by 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 force of working it'll come one day but uh um, you know air force veteran uh Long-time football coach in the community, high school, park ball. I'm just here today to spread the good word, to encourage somebody, and to also inspire somebody. And if education comes along with that, then that's what we're here for today. Yeah, and that's what's up. And I know you've been in this field for a very long time um, to just bring improvement. And I know the title of the episode, which I got, the sure you got to represent, protect the culture. And I know people probably want to know what's all what's protect the culture is. So Tim, enlighten us, educate us on protect the culture. So for those who want to know what it's all about, enlighten us what it's all about. Okay, so yeah, um for a couple of days I definitely was branding that shirt uh from this group called Black Renaissance. They're from here in the in the hometown. And the thing is, we're we're pushing Hey, the, you know, the Harlem Renaissance was in the roaring 20s of the 1900s. Well, baby, we're in the roaring 20s of the 20s. And it's kind of it's kind of about that time, you know, where they're ostracizing our community. They're limiting our speech. Uh, they are uh, suppressing our voting areas like these things are back once again. And the very things that we've created, they are actually trying to take away like where it comes in what really got everything moving now is the hbcu football games were about to become in jeopardy here in the city where they were talking about selling lad stadium our municipal stadium and to the agency the school board they were going to reduce the size to a size that would not accommodate hbcu football well that's the only place we have to play and you got to understand it's protecting the culture you got to know that when HBCUs were founded back in those days after slavery, after the Civil War was over, when these institutes popped up in the 1865s, like the Blue College in Mobile, 1867, Alabama State and Marion, uh, you know, 
after so long when these schools built football teams, they would do classics and that would be considered like a big family reunion. And it's uh, our community coming together to make money all together as one and supporting our culture and sharing our cultures with one another. Because you got to know that culture in Huntsville, the culture in Montgomery is two totally different cultures. And then when you grab grab schools that play from different states like Jackson State and Southern, you got to, when they get together for their boom box classic, you got to understand like those are two different cultures that are sharing their time with one another all in the love of the culture. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, when you see that at risk, you got to stand up and you got to protect that. You know, Bishop State, I got this shirt on, not even by design, but that's just because I'm all about preservation and promoting HBCU culture, especially right here in my own city. Yeah, I know. And we know that, as, you know, back in the day, you know, with the times, you know, especially back in the day where the HBU was very important, you know, especially with our ancestors and forefathers, how they was very big on educating. Um, compared to them times we are today, uh, Tim, do you feel like we have lost the passion, we lost the identity? Because we're in a world of social media where we want to go along with the latest trends and the fashion. Um, you see what's going on in our community right now. Uh, quote unquote gender wars and all this stuff that we lose have we really lost focus on what's important. At one time we were very we were very proud of our culture, our lineage, our inheritance. We was always into the studies, but now it's like we got past that, now we're all into the foolishness. Um, who got this? The whole Kiki Palmer and her baby father thing and how our attention is more focused on that foolishness now to what's really important. Have you? Are we being fully distracted now, easily influenced on the wrong things? Yeah, so I will answer to the first point uh, going in order of the question. Uh, I think that at a point of time, we did lose ourselves. And it was a like the woke community you know they make fun of the woke community but the woke community was the ones that had not lost themselves and refused to lose themselves and uh, and and continue to push that others not fall into the trap of losing themselves and now it's just so broad now that you know where we come from you know what it is i mean uh, honestly I, I might meet one or two people who look like me and you that might not understand what HBCU culture or what urban culture for black people directly in a black community may mean, but it's not, it's not that far fetched to believe that everybody is not aware of who they are and where they come from. And especially with so many ancestry.coms and 23 and me, like it's, it's right there in our hands for us to know exactly where we come from. We see, on social media, where we come from, we know it is presented to us. But with that social media tool, it has given us so many options. So we think to, at, at, you know, just adventure off into other lifestyles or other cultures. And we get to a point where, you know, the black struggle and the black culture here in, in, in our country, it has been so undermining and depressing to you, when you start looking at other things that you're not used to, you start desiring for those things a little bit more. And we didn't have access to looking uh, cell phones. And our ancestors and forefathers they didn't have cell phones and things like that to cross communicate and look and see what they're doing in South America and look and see what black folks doing in France or see how people up north is living in a different type of, or to even look back and say, hey, man, it's messed up everywhere versus thinking that life is better because you're white or life is better because you're rich or life is better because you live overseas. Like, it's all about who you are. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. And that's one thing we have to know. We have to know who we are each and every day, taking time to learn ourselves. And that's the most important thing. I want to give a big shout out to Fred Russell III. I had on him last week. He's a little skid. Big shout out to him. Oh, awesome big man here in the DFW, um, up and coming um, media mogul. Be shout out to him for watching us here on tonight's episode of Walking This Way's Impact Voice. And we know that you're very passionate about the laws. And that's what we should learn anyway. 
learn about the laws. I remember I, I still have that book. Um, Willie Lynch, Willie Lynch. I think I still have that book in my library. And if those who are not familiar with Willie Lynch, um, it's a great book. It talks about how Willie Lynch was teaching the slave masters how to control the masses, not physically, but mentally. And we see that going on today because it's no longer physical, it's mental now. And, and I remember in the movie, The Great Debater, when Denzel Washington was like, they want to make you strong physically, but they want to make you weak mentally. And I, when we people watch that movie, I want to know, um, T, did they actually catch what Denzel was saying when he was saying they make us strong physically, but weaken us mentally? Well, you know, I think it's pretty understanding what people can understand what he means because, you know, yeah, America, will they'll build you up where you'll have... And, and 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 they don't build you up mentally, but they do train your mind at the same time. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like it's like they'll build your mindset to think like, oh, I'm working hard, I'm strong, I'm standing alone, I'm doing this, I got this, I got that. You feel what I'm saying? They'll make mm -hmm. you strong and physically, yeah, they'll put you in the right the right situation to be comfortable, to be fine, but. They don't build us up to go out and be leaders, and I get that. It you can you can start that off with school, with the prison pipeline, with school. It's building you up to learn how to follow a system. It's not building you up to learn how to be a leader of a system, or how to implement your own system. We don't go to we don't. I mean, majority of your business teachers in in college don't even have a business. But they're teaching business technology, but they're teaching some type of business administration class. How does that work? How 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 are you so qualified to teach business yet you not have one? You're working for somebody else's business, teaching kids about business. So, and that's an example of how they build us up. Because I'm doctor, professor, somebody at so-and-so institute teaching business, yet I don't have no time to have my own business because I'm Dr. So-and-so for somebody's institute. Mm. That's a that's just one way you can look at it. So in other words, being, we don't question anything. You know, growing, they program us not to ask questions. In other words, to become a free thinker. Mm -hmm. You know, no, big shout out to our parents. We love our parents. But right. they was only they paid they was only taught what they was taught from their parents and their parents passed on to their parents, not to the point in our generation we're breaking the algorithm now. We're we're becoming more free thinkers. We're mm -hmm. asking more questions when it comes to religion, when it comes to this and that, our beliefs and like I said, the awakening. A lot of people I wanna say I wanna say a lot of people, individuals are waking up now. At one point we were scared to ask questions. Why mm -hmm. need to believe this certain way why do you do things a certain way because we never ask these questions so tell are you seeing that we're starting to ask more questions now and why i have to believe this why i have to go along with this at one point we won't question anything we'll just go mm -hmm. along with they told me to believe this and that was it but we never question anything right and so you know that's right we don't question anything and that's why i have to always give praise to the late great Angela Davis. Uh, see, I went to Love Joy Temple at preschool. And when I tell people today, they be like, oh, you went to Angela Davis Academy? I'm like, no, I went to Love Joy Temple and I was instructed by Miss Angela Davis. And when we was two, three years old, she taught us one thing. And we used to have to say it every day after the Pledge of Allegiance. I am a human being and I have a mind to think on my own. That simple. She's, she was instilling that into two and three year olds as they were learning how to become people, you know, citizens, upstanding people. So you got to think when you plant that seed that young, this is what happens because I'm a human being. I have a mind thinking my own and I and I'm so glad you asked that question because I was thinking before the call, like what type of questions or how you were forming. And I wanted to be able to talk to this point right here and just say, like, I got to give big shouts out to my mom because 
something she instilled in all four of her children is be a free thinker and don't be a follower, be a leader. I could, man, I caught plenty of whoopers to the backside while my mama was preaching, be a leader, not a follower, mm-hmm. be a leader, not a follower. And I'm getting, you know, getting the wrath of God put on, but you know what I'm saying? Hey, I, that stood out to me, be a leader, not a follower, don't run with the in crowd. And she broke that down and made it understand. She's like, you can have friends. They could be your people. You can still socialize with them. But when you see something that doesn't look right and you know they're going to do it and you know it don't look right, why would you go behind them? And I've just applied that to everything I've ever done since she put that in my head at 16, bro. And and that's a blessing. Be shocked to your mom for that to install in you the importance of becoming a free thinker. Being a leader is important. Being your own man, not following the in crowd. And we know that in the realm of politics, office, we know we have people, they run for office, they say things. But we know that when you're in office, it's all about, the Bible said when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked is in authority, the people mourn. So as you, you know, in the political field, in the arena of being an activist, a community leader, it's about you want to be right for the people, bring righteousness for the people to the people. In other words, you want everybody to have equal opportunity, fair share. And I know you're not that type where I'm getting an office, I'm do this and do that, but do, do opposite of what you say. And we know, and I know you witness that with people where they be in the office, they allow the power, whatever they call the power, maybe whatever, to influence them. And then when people ask them a question, they give them a P with a PR question. Yep, PR response. So let me ask you, how did you want to get started? What made you want to get into in your field of being an activist and community leader? Well, um, so something that was significant to me is, uh, you know, Ray Ray, Arthur Ray Russell, had two sons that lived two houses down from me. Um, and we grew up together. And that man was what you call an upstanding gentleman. Um, he saw after all his children. So he came and he spent time with those kids at least four days out of five, and you know, during the Monday through Friday. And of course, the life he lived, he was busy on Saturday and Sunday. Mm-hmm. So, you know, during the week, I would see Arthur Ray Russell all the time while I'm playing with his kids and just knowing who he was in the community and knowing what he stood for. That's actually what led me to go to radio and want to be in radio because I'm like, I like that. I want to do that. I want to be a, I want people to laugh and I want people to feel good. But at the same time, I want people to be informed about what's happening around them. And that's what he did. And so got to the radio station, found out that that's one of the reasons why he doesn't work there anymore because they went corporate and corporate only cares about the numbers and they don't care about how the community feels and how joyful their heart is. They want to see the metrics and they want to know it now. They, and we have to make a decision at this moment. We can't wait for the metrics. So you don't have them. You don't matter. You know what I'm saying? And I dealt with that for four years while still excelling to a point where I was recognized, noticed in the city, but it was going against everything that I stood for. And so, you know, after getting out of that, finding out that they wasn't taking radio back towards that anymore, not now here anyway. And, you know, knowing that I couldn't do much, uh, I got out, continued to work in showbiz, but I still never lost my passion. And it's so funny, man. I used to vent on Facebook all the time. Just like, somebody need to do something about this. Somebody need to do something about that. Somebody need to do something like <laughs> and It took this chick who you know you know how we had them high school crushes or you right. get your first job you know what i'm saying in high school and it's this cute girl who stay on the other side of the city work here one of them type situations and she just came out of nowhere she's like well if you care so much about your community maybe you ought to get involved downtown and run for city council or something because you seem to care a little bit too much and you know it took that person to really make me say damn like, I'm like, I talked myself out of it at first, but then I thought about it. So then I started getting active. I was already coaching at the high school, volunteering at the floor. And then it was when 
the park used to see me out there every day and they was like, hey man, we need you over here with the babies, man. Cause what you telling them old jokers, they need to hear young. And they, I was like, okay, cool, I'll come. So I came, City League, it had ended up ending all that stuff, but it was those guys at that city park, at Figures Park, who was like, man, dude, you be talking that talk. And they backed me, they said, hey, we want you to go at Fred Richardson. And if he come back and say something to you, we got your back. And I was like, y'all really got my back? And I was like, okay. So I did it, man. And them dudes really had my back. But I didn't even know that I had this ability in me to call out a, a 16-year politician. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and really trump him and be correct and show wrongdoing and make him have to actually – show up and respond and defend his chair like he did work and he showed up to defend his chair so it was like okay maybe we are on to something then you know when we went to the through the things with michael moore you know the, the michael moore things in 2016 that was before the first election that that was just like another sign like man maybe i am on to something maybe the community really does like what they hear you know those were the things, but I will tell you, brother, the tipping point that made me want to really run for office. After all that, I moved to Birmingham. I was doing good. Life was great. Didn't have any problems, but I'm like the way I am. I'm a family man, and I love my family, and all my siblings, uh, they were kids at this time. So, you know, I'm like, man, I'm up here doing good, and they ain't like not my family, but I'm talking about Mobile. Because you got to remember this one, Sam Jones was still struggling with his election cycle and his process. And then Sandy Stimson was coming up into the fold trying to become a mayor and running the tricks in the community. And the guys I used to hang with in Birmingham, because, uh, you know, I, I, I'll never travel anywhere and be a stranger. Uh, it's just like that. That's how we do it because we're from Mobile, you know. Right. Uh, you know, uh, but the guys in Birmingham were like, man, if you really who you say you are to them people back home, then you need to leave them up here. And I was like, man, y'all need to stop tripping. And, and them dudes were like, nah, bro, you need to leave. And we're going to be on your issue every day you up here until you leave. And so I left and I came back because I couldn't watch Mobile go under what it was going through with the, with the change coming in with Sandra Stimson because I saw exactly what it was about to be. And I could not uh, allow my community and my district to watch that councilman sit on his hands. And not not only did he just sit on his hands at that point, he even ran unopposed in that same year Sandy Stimson was elected. So I'm like, ain't nobody want to run against him? And y'all see the neighborhood? and Because, you know, I, at this point, I'm just now really coming out of the street life where we were shooting dice and doing things we had no business doing out there in the community parks and things like that. So I'm like, I know what was wrong out here. And like, my well, boy, ain't nobody run against you. Okay, then. That won't happen in four years. And it didn't happen that way in four years. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, man. We know it's a lot of work. Before we get further, we'll do, we're going to go into our first commercial break. Oh. And after our commercial break, we're going to jump right back in for Taking the Culture with Tim Hollis. We're going to be right back after this commercial break. Write your next hit stage play with C and D. What up, everybody? How you feeling? You're with me, Stretch and Six Foot Six. And I'm from WHUR on the set of this wonderful play that we just uh, witnessed for a two day event called Crucified. I knew it was the boy that boy. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know I'm saying. Director and producer of hit stage play Crucified. That's my popular commission. I gotta say, this was a great piece of work. Damn! Oh, okay. How you moving that chocolate with all the muscles and your grill messed up? Come on. Oh my God! It's like finding a sneaker with no nut. I know, baby. I know. Come on. What are you waiting for? Head over to sbhentertainment.com now to sign up. Hey, what's up, everybody? We're back here on Walking This Way Impact Wars Podcast. I'm your host, Fermi Jackson Jr. I'm broadcast once again for the DFW Dallas Fort Worth, Texas. Along with me in the studio, community activist, leader, artist, Tim Hollis. 
he's here with me talking about working in, in this field of, of politics, community leader, activist, really making a name. And I, I know you're Mario in your background. At the age of 35, you enter into that arena, into that field. At that age, being a young man, what, did they try to intimidate you at that age? By you, you know, you young, you don't know too much. Did they, did they, did they ever come at you, try to, to discourage you from running for office at that time and just really getting your feet wet? Yeah, man. So, you know, yeah, you mentioned I'm 35. Uh, just made 35 on July 1st. Um, so, you know, just passed up birthday, made it to a new phase in life. Uh, uh, yeah, man. And, you know, this, you know, I ran for office twice, 17 and 21. Uh, back in 2017, you know, we started up the trail in 16. And, you know, I would call people. Like, I would call, like, the Democrat organizations and stuff around here in the local area. The black people or whatever and i'd be like hey how do i get how do i how do i sign up to be a city councilman like what do i do like i don't know i like i need to know how to do that how do you do that black democrats down here told me how uh, what you trying to sign up for that but we already got out man i'm like they already had the election they were like nah the election ain't came up yet so i said well how y'all already got y'all man and so i hung up the phone at that point right there and I already knew what i was up against so, you know, Air Force veteran here, of course, and I worked in IT, of course. I'm going to do my research, brother. <laughs> I try to do the due diligence, you know what I'm saying, and go to the people that's supposed to be there for us, but didn't get no resolve. So got out there on the trail, and everybody like, you disrespectful. Why you ain't go to Mr. Richardson and let him know you was running for office and 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 talking about you got to kiss the rain and all this jive and stuff and i'm like what y'all talking about and then you know sitting down with all these you know black ladies these grandmothers and these great grandmothers these church women that's supposed to be called by god women you know sitting down at these political meetings with them and they just insulting your age insulting your, your you know your whole generation and saying y'all don't listen y'all don't know nothing and and uh y'all need to sit back and learn and, and and get up under folks and then you'll know which way to go mm, no how i'm supposed to get up under you when i called eight months ago trying to get up under somebody would nobody even give me access in like, so don't sit there and tell my generation what we need to do because we tired. We tired of seeing things being done the same way it was before King died. You got to understand the things that he told us we need to do, he got murdered for. He got assassinated for. But they still want to run around here and tell us to do all the same stuff that Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton want us to do. No, mm -hmm. no, nah, nah, ain't happening that way. And so, you know, when I got that approach about being too young, that's when I started being a little pushy with people. And then they were like, oh, you can't be like that with the elders. No, I can't be like that with the elders because my name is Timothy. And something my mom made me do was read both of those books a lot. And where it, just as it says, respect your elders so that your days shall be longer. The next line up under that is telling the elders not to provoke the youth. Right. <laughs> and we get a lot of that going on. Yeah, you do. <laughs> it really does. And uh, we are, I know I started to see, I don't want to say a trend, but I'm starting to see the reverse. Uh, I got to give a big shout out to a young lady here in the DFW, um, Peyton Jackson. She just turned 27. And I thought she about to get a run for office here okay. in the DFW. But we know that it's not about the age, it's all about the maturity. So I'm seeing mm -hmm. now is a lot of young people now that have not reached 40, but they are making that transition. Yeah. Of running for office now, are, are, you, are we going to see more of that now? Because at a time people worry about being want to be athletes and entertainers. Now you yourself, you in that field, and she in that field. Are we going to see more y'all in that field now, where we want to think about running for office or getting into politics? We're more focused on sports and entertainment, but now it's like and we're shifting the, the the guard now to okay. I need to get my voice heard. So that means I need to be in this office where 
do you feel like you are a voice for the voiceless, Tim? That's why I want to ask you that. Do you feel like you are the voice for the voiceless? So I'll say to that point, uh, I don't feel like I'm the voice for the voices, uh, voiceless. Two reasons, and I'll, I'll say yes and no. And the reason why I say yes is because there are people in situations where they can't reach out or they can't speak out because you have people like, say, with the last stadium deal in the school board, it's people from the school board that say, how the school board going to take this stadium and then give it 40 to $60 million. And they got schools that need that 40 to $60 million being put into it. Right. You see what I'm saying? And those teachers, they can't say nothing because they're not unionized or anything like that. And then you got people that work for the city that are saying, how are we going to sell it to them and then give it $9 million, but we haven't given it $12 million. We haven't given it $5 million in 12 years. Mm. So it's like, and they can't say nothing against that. They work for the city. So, so there are yeah. some voices. But what I like people to understand is nobody's voiceless unless God made you a mute. And if he learns sign language, you still ain't voiceless. And so we, and I tell people every day, you can do the same thing I'm doing. Google, read, sign up, speak. Google, read, sign up, speak. It's that simple. Yeah, and it's at the same building that a lot of our people are going to every day for the wrong reasons in the first place. So yeah, if you got time, how I feel about it is if you got time to go down there and, 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 and fight with the judge for your life so you won't go behind bars, why won't you go down there and fight with the judges of the city so you won't have to fight for your life that puts you in a life that makes you have to fight to go behind bars? Right, and we know behind that down in downtown, we know it's all about money. We know it's all about politics, and you know, I, when I start working inside the system, I know how it is. You know, we have young men of my color being incarcerated every single day. You see that these are, these are young men. I'm not talking about the women. Young men, young men, age of 15, 16, they are charged. They they don't go to jail now. They are charged with adult crime. So mm -hmm. now these young men are looking at prison for the rest of their life. What happened? Mm -hmm. You cut a generation off. So if the young men are being incarcerated, what is going to leave the women at? Mm. So driving the 18 wheelers and, and working the, the uh, 40 ton forklifts out there at the state docks and on the tugboats and yeah, yeah. It's, that's where they at now. They in the job for us. They doing all the hard work that that men used to do. They 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 at the shipyard, uh, welding and painting. And so it's then created a, a a real culture of women with a little bit too much testosterone built up in them. Man, they have they have a system and. Uh oh, there you go. I hear you. Yeah, there you go. Okay, um, I, I lost signal there. My bad. Nah, you good. Okay, so you know, like I say, the system has, and see, I've <laughs> me and Reggie Hill, who I be down at council with a lot, we always talk about that. Them folks start tapping with us and start messing with our signals once we get onto that good knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, so the system has basically made the black man nothing, made him weak. Yeah. made him independent when he used to be independent right. and, and we um get into and it's and it's not our fault it's no it's not our fault at all it's just the way the system was always designed anyway because we have to realize first before i go forward that we were never released from slavery i don't care how you want to look at it the the tactics of slavery have never ended and it's only being in it's being put in like this. I just did a live talking about stuff like this, city ordinances, city rules changing under the dark. So y'all don't go to city council meetings. So then you wouldn't see that they change rules like they write laws and make them and stuff. Mm -hmm. And with that, that's slavery. Like you telling me I can't speak unless five people agree. 
and then like it's seven counselors and I know if four don't like me, then it's over. If, if two don't like me, it's over with. Or three don't like me, it's over with. You know, I gotta have five to agree. But I don't think I got five of that that agree, bro. I promise you that. And you know, <laughs> you know, with that being said, black women have had to be so strong. They had to raise all their children. They didn't have to make sure their children go out and be something and not nothing. And then you know, you got those that have been on the section eight and the, the the wick and all this other stuff and the ebt and not to say anything against anybody because my granddaddy lived in the projects i didn't have ebt registered in my own name my mother came up with all her children off wick so i ain't saying there's nothing wrong with these things but you have people who abuse the system and they get that in their head that they are doing good so all the money that they actually collect because they mostly don't work real jobs. A lot of them do have, a lot of them sell drugs, all this, a lot of other stuff going on too. Yeah. And, 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 and I had to catch myself because, you know, I had to remember I ain't on my live right now. You good. Talking you good. to the people. <laughs> no, you and, good. You know, but this culture has created a, 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 a generation of women with too much testosterone and. You, you hear a lot of women now saying, or you see it on social media, I'm in my soft girl era. I'm in my soft girl era. And that's because you, I've even had women confess and, and admit, like, I don't want to be tough no more. I don't want to be hard no more. Like, I want to be a soft woman. Like, and so you do have women that realize that this has really become a problem, but nobody's really addressing the root of the problem. Right. I agree with you 1,000%. You know, you hear time, they'll tell you what the times have changed. And the at that time, it, it was it was to say, you know, everything changed, everything remained the same. And like you said, I had talked to young women who know that, hey, that's the man's job to lead and, and do these things. And they don't want to have to do those things, but by in the position they're in today, where they have to survive, they have to be responsible. If they got kids, they have to take care of their kids. And it's like a fault with the guys is, Majority of young men, I don't say young men, guys in general, uh, they want to be with him being more weak, um, pointing the finger. It's her fault that I'm not successful. It's her fault. Mm -hmm. And you look at it now where you you see more guys complaining. Cause back in the day, men just got their work, grind, hustle, do what they had to do. Not saying they do stuff illegal, but do things the right way. I see in the generation now where young men don't even want to work no more. They mm -hmm. complain about working. You know what I'm saying? So it's yep. like, I'm tired of working. A lot of people telling you, man, you young. Why you, man, you young. You're in your early 20s. You ain't got no responsibility. You just got you. You should be out here working, grinding. Back in the day, guys, you, man, pick up extra hours. They had, they, they had a vision for their life. Mm -hmm. They were more focused, okay, where they wanted to be at in the next couple of years. Now we see yep. some of these individuals now, they complain about working. But yep. I see women out here be out here hustling, bustling, grinding. Yep. Compared to this young guy, he complaining all the time. Yep. No, you know, and there's another thing that's going on too now, where, where there's a curve. It's it's actually more government money being thrown out here for these young women to go get the free training, and you know they make the men jump through these hoops because you you got you got so many different initiatives here to protect women. And you got to thank the woman suffrages movement for that. And uh, it's so many different agencies out here that provide aid for women. And black women, they they fall in line with that because it's for women. But as for us black men, you know what I'm saying? We don't get that, bro. And when we go back to test for something or, or say, like, this thing, I put my business out here for a matter. I was, um, I was targeting... A CDL because it's like, hey, I you know I got many talents. I I do many things. I've held many type of jobs. But something I don't have is a commercial license, and I would like one. But then I also know that I'm a U.S. veteran, and that there's free opportunities for me to go do that, and I don't have to do that out of my pocket. So, you know, I entered the process. But you know, one of the funny things is I don't know if it's because you know they're trying to cut down on how many opportunities they allow for people. Or if they trying to do us the same way they did us, uh, our elders, when you get to a certain age, they want to give you a literacy test. 
You know what I'm saying? But I had to take one, brother. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had to take a literacy test and I at 35. I had to take a literacy test. And it's like, that's just another way to hold us back. Because if I don't pass that, and the lady would say, oh, my God, your reading is placed at advanced and your math is at advanced. I'm like, ma'am, I'm not an idiot. Like, why am I? Because I turned around in the middle of the test and I said, why do I have to take this test? What, did, what is this going to Because I'm like, this is redundant. They're asking me the same questions over and over. And so, you know, <laughs> it was like one of those tests, like for the reading, there was no wrong answer. You just mm -hmm. had to make sure that your answers correlated with one another. To make sure that you comprehend what you were delivering or what you were reading. Like, I got to do that. Just, and that's for the Work in Alabama program. And the test is being given through mm. from the GED department. Wow. And I'm like, why, why am I taking a GED test when I have a whole high school diploma from a magnet school? Of communications and fine arts and i went to the air force why am i taking a ged test right now to go to school for something that i already earned it's amazing so they still got and that's why i was on my train yesterday talking about they bringing jim crow back to mobile he's here he's here mm -hmm. Yep. And when Tim, when you talk about that, are the people listening? Or are they just is it going in one out the other ear? So the stuff you talk about is very important. Something that we need to take heed to. It's like I'm giving you the call now. I'm I'm warning you what's about to be ready to happen. And it's like I'm gonna say I'm through this, like Noah. When Noah's being the art. They, they laughed at Noah. They mocked Noah. Oh, it ain't draining. So many, it ain't going to never happen. But when it finally happened, the people were puzzled. They was, they was in shock. Mm -hmm. Do y'all feel like you get that, that complex as well? As you, as you being Noah, building that ark, and they just sitting there mocking and laughing. Oh, ain't nothing going to happen. But then when it soon hit the fan, it's like, dang, I, I should have listened before this actually took place. <laughs> you know, I think people are waking up because, you know, it used to be a time where I felt like nobody wasn't listening. Nobody wasn't like, I felt like I was just out here doing this for no reason, really, to be truthfully honest with you, especially, right. brother, when you go from an election in four years and you almost get like a thousand, I almost get to a thousand with four people in the race. But then the next race, you got like six, seven people in the race and you get like only a little bit over 300 people voted for you. You, you start to make you question things. Like, how am I, I, I lost people? You know what I'm saying? Like, but at the same time, the whole election process lost people. And I think like here, the city had just become so lulled and dull because they got like, they got tired of hearing the, the Fred thing, the Sandy Stimson thing, beefing with each other. And, you know, when Sam Jones sat up there and black people feel like he didn't do nothing for them. And then with the whole Barack Obama thing, black people feeling like he truly didn't do nothing for black people. This city, I can speak for, went into like, oh, forget politics. And we can see that reflect in the numbers. But the more that this platform of being able to use your phone, turn on a camera and talk to people all over the, the region, all over the land, all over the world. It has changed a lot. And one thing I know about it, uh, consistency. They used to always preach consistency, consistency. And I never, you know, I used to be like, I'm consistent, I'm consistent. But I didn't understand what they meant. Like, it was like, Hey, you might not win this election, but you got to still beat on them, still beat on them, still beat on them. And come back for the second election. You might not win that one, but don't stop. Still beat on them, still beat on them. And so, you know, after both elections, I kind of stopped in a, in, a, in a phase or whatever. Because, you know, I even moved to Florida after the last election, bro. I was really done. 
with Mobile, Alabama. But I saw more detriment coming than I saw when I was in Birmingham. And, you know, we've been here fighting it, bro. That's how I get banned from city council. And, uh, you know, seeing all that, man, it's just, it's a call. It's, it's a charge and, and few, few are chosen. Men are called, you know, you know what I'm saying. Oh yeah, me and Carl Field chose. I know a while back when you was running, and I and I didn't understand this town too. When you were running for um for that seat, I seen somebody else that run for the same seat that you were running for. Mm -hmm. Young man, same color as you, and I didn't understand. I'm like, he's doing it. Why not get behind him? Why doing the same thing that he's running for? I, I didn't understand that to me. I'm all for support. If you're running for the particular seat, they just me. I'm not gonna mm -hmm. do it. If you already right. qualified to do it, I'm gonna get behind you. But I seen someone do the exact same thing you was doing, and that right there, that just really puzzled me. Like, why is you doing what Tim doing instead of just getting behind him and say, you know what, he doing the same thing. I'm gonna get behind him. I'm support him. I'm gonna endorse him. But do it. I didn't understood that. Okay. So I can break it down for you. And uh, just so for disclaimer, uh, my views and my opinions do not personally reflect or affect Walking His Ways podcast. Uh, these are my own independent thoughts. So don't charge my brother Furman Jackson for what you may hear here. Um, what I'll say is, remember, I told you Fred ran unopposed. I said that'll never happen again. I announced I was running against Fred 365 days before the election on the day, because I did my research, on the day that you can officially announce that you're going to run for the office and start receiving donations. That's the day you can receive. I can announce that, hey, I'm running for office in 2025 now, but I can't officially receive donations until the last Tuesday in August, the year before the last Tuesday in August in election year. You get what I'm saying? So I can't do nothing until next year, if, even if I wanted to do something as far as raising funds. Nobody was there. That guy was not there. He was not there when I dec uh, declared in August of 2016. And, you know, I was still on my horn. I was still, you know, I'm running against Fred. Fred they hadn't even announced if he was going to rerun for his seat. He really didn't. He did not announce. Now, people say he wasn't weighing it out to see what he was going to do with me. But some people were saying, Fred, not going to run. He just going to let you run right into it. And a lot of people saying, well, nah, Sam running for mayor. But he wanted to run for mayor. So, woo -de woo uh, That's how that was. So, you know, so we had a real – and I was already going to city council meetings every Tuesday. So, you know – it's like Fred, I see me every day and I'm at him like, hey, brother, it's on. Hey, it's on. Challenge me to a debate. Challenge I'm in the city council chambers every Tuesday. I want to debate you. I want to debate you. I ain't that guy nowhere around. You know what I'm saying? Where, yeah. Where's this guy? Where's this guy at? And so I was minding my business. I did not go to the Trinity Garden Parade in 2017. And one of my good righteous partners, J45, was James Lewis Jackson. He hit me up. He said, hey, Tim, you know this name of so-and-so? I said, who is that? I said, and I don't know, and I really don't care. Uh, I'm kind of busy. Why? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He said, well, brother, I just wanted you to know because the Negro in the parade talking about he running for your chair that you running for. And this is well off into all, this is February. You know what I'm saying? Going into March. In fact, I think Mardi Gras, yeah, Mardi Gras that year was a little early. No, 2017, Mardi Gras fell in March because it was hot. I remember that. So this was in March when the Trinity Garden Parade come through. This spring, they kicking it off, letting it be known. Now, Sandy Stenson came to me the last week of January in 2017 and said, are you seriously going to run for city council? I said, you can bet. Win, lose, or draw, I'm going to be there, sir. And I'm talking about like he rolled up on me in the atrium, like with his whole little lynch mob. And you got to realize that was like a lot of people don't understand like what Sandy Stinson running up on you for at that time. Well, you got to understand from 
from 16 to 17 with the Michael Moore stuff, I was his main target. I was his main baby because he was my main target. You know what I'm saying? So we was at a lot of meetings sitting at the other side of the tables. I'm representing the community, and he represented the administration. So that man rolled up on me and said, you really run? I said, yeah. And that was his trick because, you know, that guy who ran and who eventually won the second time around, um, his mother-in-law is one of the biggest donors and supporters for Sandy Stimson, and is also the person who brought Tucker down here for the fish fry. So, you know, you know there it is, man. And then they had a campaign event during that uh, uh, rookie year that we had, and they had the new, they said, uh, uh, an uh, evening with the mayor candidate Sandy Stimson and political newcomers Corey Penn and Leola Cheney. And everybody was like, Well, since they talking about newcomers, why your name ain't on that Tim? Like, so then we was able to put two and two together that day. Aha. Aha. And everybody will tell you, the dude running with my platform. <laughs> yeah, you know, I didn't understand it when I seen that. Cause like okay, you running for this? Why not get behind Tim? Cause he's doing this, and that I, like I said, that really puzzled me, and that, that really like wow, we're not supporting each other. I see the division. I, it's like divide and conquer method. I remember, I, I got, I remember my old supervisor used to say this. Even though he you know got degrees and stuff. He said he would never run for Secretary of State because you have certain credentials to, in order to run for Secretary of State. You got to be fluent in these different languages. He said, I would never take that position because I'm not qualified. When well, you mm -hmm. have this individual who do not have the credentials, will get up there and take it and say it's a blessing from God, but don't have the credentials, don't have the qualifications. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm going to get It's like, okay, I know my limitations. Right. I'm not I'm not into that arena. So why would I run with something that I'm not qualified to be in? That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm letting somebody else run for it who's already qualified. I'm just going to endorse them, support them, uh give donation, get the word out, because they are already custom made for that position. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that guy even admitted to people that it ain't what he thought it was. And one thing I told him. On the, you know, after the election was over with, and I think I told anybody that ever ran across me, I said, "Yeah, he won," but I'm still the district. I, I, I said, "I'm, I'm still the, the councilman in Tomanville." You know what I'm saying? Like he might be the councilman over the district, but I got my neighborhood. Believe that. And one thing about it is, we gonna be accountable, um, holding accountability measures up against them too. Because guess what? Just to show about it, won that election, beating the chosen one, who they was choosing. You gotta know that they would have been, it would have been targets coming down at me every week. Ah, Mister Hollis, you know, they would have been pulling them. You know, you'd have had all them Tom, Dick, and Harris coming out to get at me. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, uh, one thing we was doing is let them know we're gonna hold you accountable. We're gonna hold you accountable. And it's clearly like everybody that watched the debate on WKRG, which is on YouTube, uh, it's still on YouTube today. They was like, man, you won that debate hands down, which clearly shows you debate don't mean nothing. You got to get up and walk to them polls. You got to. That's what's up. You got to. Hey, Tim, we're going to take another commercial break. Now it's a commercial break. We're going to jump right back in our entire conversation with Tim Hollis, the take the coach. We'll be right back at this commercial break, everybody. All right. You just did. <laughs> Don't be scared. Keep running up on me. And I will unload this clip and blow your entire dick off your fucking body. Bitch, I told you here in that slimy ass hole. We about to get that ass on the floor. That bitch by the damn. Sir, ma'am, I said shut the fuck up. Lock down every airport, bus station, and train station within 100 miles from us. <laughs> Please, I'm sorry. I know you won't, Mr. D'Angelo. I'm sorry. Sorry.
Mao Gannon Raspberry is a notable name in the entertainment industry for a Greek talent. She is a model, radio host, voice of artist, writer, entertainer, actor, and an amazing director who has built a formidable and amiable brand for herself. She is a vibrant, diligent, versatile, and devoted goal getter who often empties herself into every role and never ceases to crack fans' read with the interpretation of a comic role. She later dived into a radio show, Miss More Intimate Talk Radio. A radio the show hosted for four amazing years, raising different subjects of discussion, battering intimate conversations about life and cultures, and she has also been featured in several TV shows and web series. Been recognized and interviewed by many notable magazines, she has equally trained with Javan Johnson and Marishka Phillips, to mention a few of her pieces of training. Her movies and theater performance include In the House City, South Quarantine, Quad City, Sister Soldier, Love Bugs, A Split Second. Preaching Lies, The Conscience, Threesome, Fatal Attraction, Snap, Inreversible Desires, The Story Before the Glory, Stick Me Up, Wide Open, Trans Me Reloaded, Tiffany and June's Season 1 and Season 2, Inreversible Desires, Can't Get Right, just to mention a few. In 2022, she was nominated and awarded Best Supporting Actor at the Atlanta Decem Awards where she was crowned Queen of the Eagles and named Ngozi, which means blessing. She has also gotten many recognitions and awards award nominations to her name. This Emma Awards team is once again delighted to honor a notable, elegant and resourceful African-American woman for her contributions to the entertainment industry and also for being an exemplary leader. She's continued to motivate many with a great talent and a beautiful personality. The African-American community is proud to have Maogani Raspberry as ours. Congratulations Maogani Raspberry. We appreciate you. <laughs> Hey, what's up, everybody? We're back here on Walking This Way's Impact Wars Podcast. You see it doing a big thing. We got commercials going on. Um, big shout out to Mahogany Raspberry. She is from my hometown of Mobile, Alabama. She's been doing acting. She's been an actor for so many years. She lives in Atlanta. Um, so big shout out to her. She grew up in the Thomasville area. So big shout out to her um, being a Mobile native. Hey, pursuing your dream. And big shout out to her. So we are doing commercials, ladies and gentlemen. So get with me. You have any commercial where you're doing music, Branding, you got an upcoming event. I'll be glad to showcase it here on the podcast. So, hey, we're doing big things here on the show. So, I'm back in the studio with Tim Hollis. Um, brother, I thank you once again for hanging out with me here on the show. You know, Stranger was on here before. When I first transitioned here to the DFW, and you like my second guest on here when I transitioned here, I reached out to you. Glad to accept the invitation. I know you're doing a lot of great work back home in Mobile. You're still out there in the streets. You're still out there. Let your voice be heard. And talk about the band that happened. I know you mentioned that. Um, if you want to talk about that, what oh. happened with that band and how did it all come about? All right, man. So <laughs> first I want to say, uh, yeah, big shouts out to you uh, advancing with the with the uh, commercials, man. I, I can tell you run on a totally different platform. Everything is beautiful over here. Um, I'm interested. I want, I want to see that... Um, um, stage play promo again. Send that to me because that was funny. I want to find out more about them. And uh, okay, go ahead and answer your question. Uh, you know, the band. So the band came from man. I've been doing this with now. I've been running for offices since 2016, but I've been petitioning the council since 2014. Like I've been going to the podium since 2014, really 2013, and you know, when you look at it, all the councils during that time frame up until the last one that was just voted in or whatever, which we'll just leave it voted in, because uh, we think they stole all that, but we're gonna leave it as voted in. Uh, <laughs> You know, so you that's you got to already understand. I'm talking to them because I feel like they don't even deserve to be up there anyway. Now, the people before them, the Freds, the Best Riches, the, all those people like that, the Levon Mazzies, you know what I'm saying? We go up there, we tell them what's wrong in the neighborhood, what, what they could do better, what we think they could do better, what we would like to see them do more of, or, you know, 
bring it to the table where you got to have a public hearing like let have a community meeting in the neighborhood and let us know what you about to do with something in our neighborhood like don't just put it on the city council agenda uh friday and then say i'm gonna vote on it on tuesday like you don't do that like so you know we going to them telling them like hey man you know we petitioning and we pleaded with them for three weeks now whereas if we would have petitioned and pleaded with fred uh gina gregor all them other people best rich and stuff like that back when those ogs was up there that demanded transparency and called for accountability like those people they would have actually questioned the mayor's administration they would have wanted to see budget reports they would have wanted to see uh opinions from the attorney general not hear about it but see it like before we say yes that you can spend the money on this we need to make sure ain't nobody gonna go to jail behind this like that's what they was on and so this these guys up here they ain't doing that our council was set up to be a system of checks and balances not do whatever the mayor asks you to do like that's the way it was set up our government based off 1985 was set up to be strong council weak mayor got like that because before 85 we had a three commissioner system no mayor all three of those commissioners were prejudiced and that didn't work so michael figures got with a lot of other lawmakers and they made the zogby act and the zogby act is the law of the city of mobile which created the city council the seven districts where it's supposed to be four black three white and you know and they're all supposed to be equal to one mayor so it's supposed to have two mayors over the city and that's how that works so we're checking those guys and these guys ain't built with that fortitude so to silence us because they didn't know how to come back with us or even come together with us they would rather silence us and get us away because they ain't out here to work with us they're out here to execute all the plans of sandy stimson like that's simply put and so those guys sent me a letter um uh, it came from me you know chastising them at the podium and then you know i did a loud outburst called them out um uh, embarrassed them on the old rules because the police tried to escort me but they didn't know the rules of course i i ran for that thing twice so of course i'm gonna know the rules in the room and i i pushed the rules to the extent where they couldn't do anything but deal with it because when you know that a, a, a good a good person and a criminal both know the law and one know the law enough to break it and one know the law enough not to even go nowhere near it. well when it comes to government and being uh, activists and things like that you got to be ready to get in some good trouble right. so if you know the law then you got to be able to push the law enough to bend it but not break it and that's what i did so to fancy themselves they sent the letter to me and two other people that were active in the protest and the outbursts and things like that but one thing they didn't do was cite a code or a statute that was broken all it was was rhetoric about feelings and opinions and because we all filed cases with the doj because we all protested about it because we harassed news media who still wouldn't cover it because we went facebook lies facebook post crazy yelling at the chief of police when we see him and he didn't even know that his police was even being put on assignment like that because the mayor is all they you know what i'm saying all they boss and the chief of staff is they next direct boss and the old and the chief of staff that's their next direct boss is the former chief of police so that was the chief of police during the michael moore incidents so it's just like so much it's like a decade worth of animosity built mm -hmm. up in this room so that's how your young brother got banned and you know <laughs> wow. because and they sent the certified mail brother had to sign for it and it was delivered to me on my birthday <laughs> oh wow and when you got that when did what went through your mind that time like damn like well i had a little tip that it was coming you know what I'm saying? Somebody tipped us and, and let us know, like, hey, man, you probably finna get... It was actually from a council, you know, because I had what we would call a Sicilian sit-down with one of them um, the day after the last time I went crazy 
at the one that made the news where they said chaos in the Mobile City Council Chambers. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we sat down and he said, hey, man, you're probably going to get suspended. Uh, they're probably going to bar you from the council meetings for a couple of days. And I was like, brother, they send that letter to me. That'll be the worst mistake they ever made. And it has turned out, my brother, <laughs> mm. that that has been one of the worst mistakes that they ever made because not only did you send it to me, but you sent it to other people that's just as fluent and knowledgeable about the process as me. And so we got a real thing going. And today, my brother, we tested the waters We because the chief of police said, you're not putting this uh, people in front of that. The mayor and the chief of staff then already said to the city council, like, we're not getting involved with that. That's your battle. You deal with it. And so they are wrong. So what they're trying to do now is they're trying to change the laws at city council meetings so that what they did on those letters can be justified going forward in the foreseeable future. But we went in the meeting today and we sat in there and looked at them and ain't nothing happened. Because the police already said, we're not doing nothing. They ain't broke no laws. They ain't did nothing. You can't silence people. You got retired council people, white and black, saying they know they wrong. Go to the DOJ. Go to Southern Poverty Law. Get some action going about yourself. And, and that's what we've been doing. And they scrambling. Mm. We know much is given, much required. And we know just seeing, listen to you, I ain't realize how much, it's just so much stuff behind the scenes that people don't realize the give and take the ins and outs wow i mean this is it's it's out here we know that it's we know it's real it's out there the powers to make the powers to be and all this stuff, this stuff is really real and then mm -hmm. let's know in the movies especially if you see and i tell anybody go see that new mission impossible with tom cruise that movie lets a lot of gems in that movie and i remember mentioning where the guy mentioned to manipulate the minds of millions uh -huh. And that lets you know that how they play on our mental psyche. If I manipulate the minds of millions of people, I gain control of the masses. Right. And we see that every day. It's like it's no longer it's not a physical thing. It's mental mental. Okay, I can influence them so easily, I can make them do things mm -hmm. that I don't have to do because I'm I'm gonna use them to do it. Right. Like the ice bucket challenge. Yeah. How much money they raise for ALS. <laughs> mm. And it's just people just being silly, trying to be like, I want to do the ice bucket. <laughs> and it, it goes. It, 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 it's, that, it's that domino effect. Right. It's like manipulate the minds of millions, cheap. And we know that that goes on. And that really is. But going back to it, much is given, much required. There. And we know it takes a special individual yourself to do the things that you're doing. And I know that hey, you've been you've been set sent by God to do a great work as this. It's all this, man. It ain't me. Right. Yeah, you said it, bro. Yeah, I promise you, it ain't me, man. That's why I have to tell a lot of people. They're like, how you do it like that, man? Because I'll tell people they say, I say, well, you can go do the same thing I do. And folks be like, man, I can't do it like you do. But yeah, I know. And folks will say, yeah, I know I can do it, but not like you. And I say, well, to first know, it ain't me that's doing it. Because before I go to that podium, anytime before I speak, before I get on the news and do an interview, I always center myself and I always bring myself to God and I always ask him to take over and pilot. Say the right things, don't let me mess up and say the wrong things. Yeah, that's it. And that's what it's all about. And I know, I'm going to talk about that too. I know you mentioned how the uh, Mobile County School Board purchase last stadium for so many millions of dollars correct um what is their plan for that why did they why did they sell it to the uh mobile county school system all right so they actually sold it to them for one dollar <laughs> they sold it to them for one dollar brother in the intergovernmental agreement so basically what it is uh it's a land swap what they really doing and it's going to be uh, where they both going to generate revenue off of it together. But it's going to be solely in the hands of the Mobile County Public School System. Now, 
City Council did vote to sell it. They did vote to, uh, on the agreement. It's fair. Um, but the school board still has to vote on it on Monday. I think they'll have a working session about it on the 19th, and that's tomorrow, I believe. Uh, today, the 18th, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, they'll have a working session on it tomorrow uh, about what the city council just approved today. And then they'll actually vote it in to law or not into law at their general body meeting on Monday. And, uh, you know, uh, man, they really finna uh, try to, the school board wanted to take it down to a 25,000 seater. And the reason why they want to take it down to the 25,000 seater because it's going to be a sports and entertainment complex and they want to reduce seats. They're going to take away the north and the south end zones. And that's what they're projecting that they will do. Take away the north and the south end zones and then they will consolidate uh, the east and west uh, end zones and things like that. And then I'm um, just saying like the concourse and stuff will have like some real not I wouldn't say like five star, but it'll have some like notable type dining and concession in the mm -hmm. concession area. But the overall goal is for it to be Murphy High School's home stadium. And um, you know, even with it being twenty five thousand seats, it was gonna be the biggest um stadium for high schools um, and not just Mobile, but in all of Alabama. And I think um, like within this whole little region. And so, you know, Murphy is seven, eight of the highest class of athletics you can get to. Um, so, which means, you know, the population of students is pretty high. And, you know, that's what that state is going to be for having different baseball games and soccer games and football games and, stuff like that but the city council said no it's got to be a 30,000 seater and from what I'm understanding is the school board is like okay well they didn't want to do 30,000 because they said don't they really didn't want to do 25 they really wanted to do 20,000 you know like I say taking away the end zone so it's going to be 10,000 on one side 10,000 on the other side it's going to be a little cheap little high school stadium with a couple of amenities around it and now we're being told that it's going to be something that we wouldn't imagine would come to that community. And, you know, it's just going to have 10,000 less seats. Mm -hmm. So we're just waiting to see how this goes. But one of the great things that I haven't been sharing with people is that there's still a clause in the contract that allows the city council to come back down the line and snatch that thing back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but we shouldn't have to get there. That's all. Yeah, he right. Because I remember um, when Sandy Sanford left, when he was running for office, he had ideas of doing this, doing that. I think at one time, did he want to shut down the career? Was at one time he wanted to shut down the, the uh, civil center? And at one time, mm -hmm. he, he called, it would cost them the uh, city millions of dollars to keep it going. And, yeah. And all that stuff. I remember at one time he wanted to shut down the civil center. And it's funny that you mentioned that because just the week before the news about last stadium came out, they had just awarded to spend $329 million in renovations and upgrades over at the city center. So my thing is like, even if that's what you want to do with the civic center to bring it up to a new modern level, like why couldn't last stadium get that same love from the, from the city and, and people benefit off of it? Like, I don't get it. Yeah, I mean, I knew what some was, uh, especially when um, South Alabama was getting a stadium. I said, you know, I figured what they finna start doing. They gonna try to transition over there with the high school games, the senior bowls, and all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Is that even, what is it, what is it, an even trade thing? And I just, it's like, I knew some stuff was going on. Like, yeah, they finna shut that down with it over here. So they need nice facilities and that. But why didn't they put money into last stadium? Especially we had the senior bowl. Cause I remember at one time, where well, they were threatening years ago, they were threatening to take the senior bowl, no, the senior bowl away. And mm -hmm. then they first time they were talking about moving it to Florida. And then they tried to try to upgrade, do all this stuff. 
Because at one time, I know they were threatening to take away the senior bowl. Yeah, they were. And uh, so, but the senior bowl people not happy out there at, uh, at South Alabama because you can't get the tailgate experience that you used to be able to get at LAD. And um, you can't get a lot of things going on because you're on the college campus as well. So you got certain rules and laws that you have to follow. Uh, mm. But when you was at last stadium, you was on municipal property. So you just out there in the city streets, really. <laughs> you know? And uh, that's what made that dynamic and everything was grouped and close together. Mm. But, uh, yeah, so they were tricked out there. The bowl games was tricked out there, too. Uh, but everybody thinking about coming back this way now, especially with, and that's one of the main selling pieces of talking about senior ball or potentially come back now because this will be a bigger stadium. It'll be central to everything. And, you know, the, the airport right there, you got yeah, the I remember that. A downtown right there. So it'll only make sense. But the whole thing was uh, – South Alabama used that stadium for free for nearly 10 years, man. And I said free. They used that stadium for free for nearly 10 years. And on leaving, they didn't put not one red penny into it. They didn't put one red penny until they left it the way they left it, not the way they found it. And it's then Councilman Carroll got mad at me at the last council meeting before Christmas when I told him last stadium was a dumpster fire. And he got mad at me and said, no, it's not. It's not a dumpster fire. But now you out here talking about the, it's dilapidated conditions and this is why we need to sell because it's, it's, it's shocked. And you know what I'm saying? Like, so why not just address the issue and give it money like, Mr. Reggie Copeland them did. Uh, when Mr. Reggie Copeland and Clinton Johnson and all them folks was up there sitting on uh, city council back in those days, they had the budget at 500000 a year. So you got to think over the course of 20 years, that's going to be $10 million being pumped into the stadium. Well, Sandy Stimson came around and he started saying where well, the city was spending too much money at. And that was one of the places that he deemed them spending too much money yet and you know um he took the budget down but after we started fighting him in 2018 the city council was able to draft the bill that provided 200,000 a year to the stadium you know what i'm saying like but that man had took it down to like I think the stadium was getting maybe 50,000, 25,000 a year, man. Mm. From 500,000 a year. That's a epic drop off. Yeah. You might as well not give me anything. And then it eventually got to not giving last stadium anything and letting them fend for themselves because he was also doing it under the disguise of why South Alabama was using it. So Damn. South was up, South was paying for what they wanted to do there. You know what I'm saying? Anything that it cost them to operate, they was paying for. Right. And okay, the lights need to be fixed. Well, this is our game, and it reflects us. So yeah, we're gonna fix the lights. Oh, we need to be some paint. It needs to look fresh up here. Yeah, we're gonna make it look fresh up here. Okay, boom. Mm -hmm. You know, they would do what they needed to do for them, but they didn't do anything to preserve that stadium and they just ran it down. We see this going on. We'll jump right. We got another commercial coming up, Tim. And after that, I'm going to get you with your final remarks. We'll be right back after this final commercial, everybody. All right. Hey, what's up, everybody? We're back here on Walking This Way's Impact Wars Podcast. Tonight's episode is called Protecting the Culture with Tim Hollis. We're about to get ready to leave the studio. We're about to get ready to get off the air. Great conversation. If you miss it, go back, look on YouTube. 
uh, Twitter. Go back on the Facebook page as well. Um, so we got to get out of the studio. Uh, Tim, do you have any final remarks you want to leave here with the listening audience that's going to listen right now? And as eventually go back and listen to the replay just in case they missed it live. Okay, man. You know, I just want to let everybody know, man, you know, I'm humble and I'm thankful for being here. Now, I'm only humble to be here, but I'm not a humble person at all because I don't believe in weakening yourself down in the arena that I play in. And, uh, uh, you know, but I'm glad that I had the opportunity to be here, that you created this for me. You know, you're one of the most respectful people I know, man. Every time I send you something or you ask for an update, you'll thank me. And I'm the one that's thanking you. Like, and I'm just <laughs> like, hey, no, no, thank you, brother. So I want to tell you again, man, thank you for bringing me here because anytime that I'm able to speak on what I actually do for the people and to the people, I'm appreciative of it because any chance that they need to hear, that they can hear this, they need to hear it. Not just for me either, you know. And if you heard anything and you you don't agree with some of the stuff I was saying or you want more information, I mean, I'm my inbox is open, people. Um, I'm open on all social medias. Um, 251-Pastor-T. That's 251-Pastor-T. Facebook, Facebook. Um, it's just Pastor T or Tim Hollis. Find one of those pages, but on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, um, you name it, over anything else other than Facebook, it's 251 Pastor T. Yeah, that's what's up. And I say, I appreciate you, T. I'm hanging out with me. I know you, I don't want to say the word busy, I know you're a very productive man, and I mm -hmm. know. Glad to great lead the studio. I appreciate you once again. I'll be back here tomorrow night at the same time. I got an artist out of DFW. Big shout out to Day Day, David Reed. He gonna be with me, young up and coming brother. I ain't when I first met that brother almost a year ago. He was downtown. I was I, I was working working out downtown, and he went to the building. He was selling burritos and stuff like that. Little hustler. When I look at that young man, it's like he shut up overnight. He doing music, making videos. He doing mm -hmm. tours now. Very humble young man, and I got him on the show tomorrow night. So big shout out to little, I call him my little brother, big uh, little day day. He gonna mm -hmm. be with me tomorrow night, talking about his music and other stuff that we gonna talk about tonight. But I appreciate you uh, once again, Tim. I give you a cigar. We get a ladies' day roses, but we gotta get a fellas' day cigar. Cause we say, I don't give my man any roses. Nah, we don't get a man flowers. Let's give him cigars. So that's what they deserve. So. Yes, do you have any up up in the? I know you're doing a lot of stuff in the community. Uh, Tim, do you have any upcoming events that we need to know about? Um, let the people know what's going on next with you. Um, hey, the mic is yours. Well, uh, really, as far as community events, I don't have anything coming up, but uh, it is Alabama Hip Hop Week, and I do okay. lend my services to DJ Dirty Dan every year. Um, I just hosted day two of his MOB Music Fest this weekend at Cathedral Square. So, you know, that was a great opportunity for me and a great time to be amongst other genres of music. Um, as far as my artistry and my entertainment lifestyle, um, you know, I do R&B Thursdays with a notable DJ by the name of DJ Black here in the city. And we're at Flavors in Pritchard, Alabama trying to bring back and revitalize the spirit of downtown Pritchard. And, um, you know, uh, working on my blues music, brother, Southern Soul Blues. Okay. So um, be able to kick something out to you, hopefully around the second week of August, man. Well, I look forward to it. <laughs> I yes, look forward sir. to it. I right, look, man, I said, keep me posted, keep me updated what's going on. You have any video footage, my brother? Hey, I'll be glad to play here on, on the platform. Because it's all about supporting each other. And I'm not just talking because we're on the show, but right. actually being about it and this stuff like that. Cause I remember that like when you were running that last time, you see me some, and I gave you a donation too. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what's all about. It's all about the living, all about right. everybody get on here and talk about it, but let's just be about it. You know what yes, I'm saying? Sir. That shows the integrity of a person. Like, you may really be about it. You know, you got people where they say they blow smoke, but then they really <laughs> don't back it up. Right. So. Man, support your fellow man, support your fellow sister when they're doing something positive. At the end of the day, we all going to benefit from it at the end of the day. So that's pretty much sums it up. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, y'all have a great Tuesday night. Remember the graveyard. Everybody had one thing in common. They thought they were going to see tomorrow, and they didn't. 
Let's live life like it's our last. Most important, man, love yourself, respect yourself, honor yourself. Um, tell yourself I love you. Tell yourself I got your back. Uh, Most important, believe in yourself. Tell yourself we're going to make it. Tell yourself we're going to succeed. Tell yourself right. we're going to conquer. Tell yourself we're going to dominate. Speak those things over your life. The Bible said death and life is the power of the tongue. So eat the fruit thereof. Let's speak life. We are already in the middle of, we're already in the seven months. This is 18th. This is July 18th, 2023. We're in the middle of July. We're about to get ready to go into the eighth month. This year is almost out. We got to ask ourselves, are we satisfied where we at or do we want more? And I'm not talking about the material things. I'm talking about being better versions of ourselves. Because we constantly got involved. Each and every day, it's going to be a new firm. It's going to be a new team. At 12 on 1, it's gonna be, we're going to be a whole different individual because we're constantly involved. So let's involve. Don't stop involving. Let's build ourselves, step our game up, and let's keep fighting this good fight. So, hey, the marathon continues, like Nipsey said. So that's pretty much. Tim, you have anything else you want to leave with us? Oh, man, just bless yourself, brother. Bless yourself. Continue doing what you're doing, bro. Uh, you know, I, I see you say a lot of times, you know, you didn't come out here to fail. And I say that about myself a lot, man. You know, I didn't, I didn't jump off the porch to fail. You know, I didn't start speaking up for the people to fail. So uh, my advice to us, just keep going, bro. Hey, that's it. Keep going, fellas. Ladies and gentlemen, keep going. And remember, we're not here to lose. No matter what, if you back at home in my hometown of Mobile or you're in the DFW or around the surrounding areas, whatever city you at, tell yourself, I didn't come here to lose. And that's what you have to do. Remind yourself every day because at times, we can get that spirit of complacency try to creep in, mediocre, mediocre try to creep in on you, but you have to tell yourself, I did not come here to lose. So you got to tell yourself that every day, whether you're your own business, whether you work for somebody, whether you a man, woman, whether you married, single, or what, tell yourself, I did not come here to lose. Great information out here in the world, ladies and gentlemen, that we can take hold to. Some good information is good, some is bad, but take the best out of it. Educate yourself. Remember, our forefathers, our ancestors, they educated themselves. Educate yourself. Invest in yourself. And it takes money to do those things. Invest in yourself. This is our time. I don't want to say season. Everybody, this is your season. No, this is our time. The time is now. Tomorrow's not promised, let alone, five, let alone Tim, five, six, not even promised to us. Right. So we need to take advantage of these opportunities because tomorrow is not promised, ladies and gentlemen. Let's forgive people that who wronged us, crossed us, or whatever. Let's make sure our heart is pure. Because we never know when we're going to get called home. So we got to be careful and make sure our heart is right before the Most High. So that's all I have to say on that, too. I will be back here tomorrow night here on Walking This Way, Impact Boys Podcast. Y'all have a great night, everybody. Peace. <laughs>